All right. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about each catalog tonight, but let me start by just giving a little introduction of who I am and what my background is and uh, why I'm here. So um, I am one of the co-founders of Hortonworks. I've been working on uh, things related to Hadoop for five plus years now. I actually, I worked for um, Yahoo for about eight years. And the first four or so of that were on a in-house database project, and then I moved over and started working on Pig right when it came out of Yahoo Research, and I uh, turned into an open source project and a more production level project. So I've been on that since summer of 2007. The last um, couple of years, I've also been working on H Catalog. I was one of the people that helped get it started inside um, inside Yahoo, and then. Last summer, we uh, split out and started Hortonworks. I've also um, written a book on Pig, which you guys may have seen, called Programming Pig from O'Reilly. Um, it's one of those funny things about you know, working in the Hadoop world. I dreamed all my life of writing a book. Even as a little kid, I wanted to write a book. I never envisioned that Programming Pig would be the title of it. <laughs> have to say. Um, so, um, and before you ask, I didn't pick the name Pig for the project. In fact, I didn't pick any of these names. I've been frustrated by attempt to name my various Apache projects. Um, but um, I can tell you later sometime if you're interested on uh, how that name came about. Um, I'm also part of the Apache Software Foundation. I'm a member, so Apache is the software foundation that all these open source projects are a part of. Being a member means that I help um, you know, I am a voting member of this foundation. I help vote on what thing, you know, who runs the foundation and all that kind of stuff. There are hundreds of members inside Apache. And then I'm also a, a member of the Incubator Apache, which is a group that brings in new projects and mentors them and teaches them the Apache way. So that's a little bit about me. Now I want to find out a little bit about you, because it always helps me to kind of guide my talk if I know a little bit of who I'm talking to. So let me just, we'll, we'll start out at specifically what I'm talking about tonight. How many people here have used H Catalog? Okay, not surprising. How many people at least have <coughs> kind of know, think they know what it is? Okay, so tell me a little bit about how you're using, if you're using, well, okay, let me, let me say that. How many people here today are actually using Hadoop on at least a somewhat regular basis? Of those, tell me a little bit about the tools you're using. You're using Hive, yeah, um, Pig, some Pig, other, well, HBase. I should ask who's using HBase here. A fair amount of HBase users. Okay, what what other things on Hadoop are you using that I'm not covering here? Streaming. Streaming. Okay, Hadoop streaming. Scoop. Get the data in and out. Chuckwa? Oh, interesting. Okay, for what are you using Chuckwa for? Collecting, okay, log collection. All right. Uzi. Okay, Uzi, makes sense. RMR. What? RMR. RMR? Yeah, the R mapreduce. Oh, okay. Of course, the R code is not produced. Right, right. Um, any Mahoot users? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so we've got a good smattering of everything. Okay, cool. Um, so my purpose in this talk is really to um, introduce you to each catalog and plus talk, talk a little bit about what's there right now, what it does now, and give you a flavor of where we want it to go and you know, what our vision of it will look like, or our vision for what it will look like in a year. But I also want this to be interactive. I don't just want to kind of come download a bunch of stuff and then go away. So, you know, please ask questions. Feel free to poke harder on parts that interest you more, and we can spend more time on that and on all that. So, you know, ask your questions as they come along. All right. So, let me start by setting the stage for why we think H catalog is important. Um, and there's several reasons it's important, but I want to talk about kind of the initial motivating use case, and then I'll talk later about some of the other things that are important about it. So, 
working in the Hadoop community, one of the things we noticed is there are a lot of different tools that people use to access their data. Um, right? We saw that just here when I asked you, you know, how are you getting at your data? And we got lots of different responses of tools you're using. Um, so you've got some people writing actual MapReduce code. Um, often these are the early adopters. You know, they started on Hadoop back before there were any other realistic options. Um, or they're, they're doing things that you just really can't do in a relational model, so something like Pig or Hive is a good choice. Um, you have people using Pig for doing uh, XDL, which uh, is an acronym for Extract, Transform, Load. You know, it means it's pulling the data out of whatever other systems it's in, sticking it in Hadoop, and then cleaning it, uh, munging it into the form you want, and load it into your database, all that kind of stuff. And then you have a lot of people using Hive for doing traditional analysis, connecting to BI tools, all that kind of stuff, right? So you, so you see these different ecosystems in Hadoop. And this is actually one of the huge strengths of Hadoop, right? One of the weaknesses of, in my opinion, in, of traditional database systems is there's one door, SQL. And you best like that door, right? That's, that is the way you get a data. And don't get me wrong, I think SQL is a great thing for a certain set of problems. If you want to form a query against a table or set of tables and understand something, SQL is a great solution. But there's a whole set of other problems in which SQL is not such a great solution. Right? If you're trying to do graph analysis, if you're trying to do session analysis, um, a lot of those kind of things, SQL is not such a great solution. So I think this, is, this plethora of tools is actually a, a significant um, bonus for Hadoop, right? But that leads to, um, it leads to a problem. <coughs> Oops, this is the, the weakness is, it makes it hard to share your data, right? You get these silos of data. You get people who don't know how to share their data together. And I put, put together a little kind of, I don't know, you can call it a comic or illustration of this or whatever, but this is, this is seriously, I mean, there's a little bit of humor in here, but this is seriously what I see happening in the Hadoop world. So on, the, on your left here, we have Bob, the, the programmer who uses Pig to crunch all his data, right? And apparently Bob is trying out for the next Matrix movie or something, because he's got monitors all over the place there that he uses. But, you know, this is your kind of back-end data factory kind of guy who sits there and crunches all the, the data sets together. On your right, you have Joe, the analyst, who uses Hive to build reports and, and do ad hoc queries. Right? So two very typical user sets you're going to have on a Hadoop system using tools suited for what they're trying to do. But often, it turns out that Joe needs Bob's data. Right? So Joe will say, Joe will say to Bob, hey, I need, I need today's data. Right? I, need your, I need your data set. And Bob says, OK, that's cool. But now Joe's got a problem. Right? He doesn't know where the data is. He doesn't know what format it's stored in. He doesn't know whether it's compressed. Um, he doesn't, and, and he has to issue a command to load this into Hive. Right? There's a whole set of, there's a bunch of knowledge here, and there's a set of manual operations that have to go on. Now, of course, realistically, people tend to use systems like Uzi to codify this. Right? But you still have a situation that as soon as you decide, um, hey, you know, we found this more efficient format. We decided that if instead of storing our data in sequence files, we moved to RC files, we could get a better compression ratio and our high queries would be more efficient because we're using, because uh, we're only accessing five of the hundred columns that are in that data in a given query. Well, now you've got to go change all those processes, right? Including um, Bob's pig process that generates the data because now he has to generate it in a different format. So, uh, so Bob's response here is to, we need age catalog, right? If this is kind of the first use case this was built to solve, is to bridge this gap so that these users were in totally different worlds. So um, this slide kind of shows the same thing in a tabular format instead of a, a nice comic format here, which is, these different tools have different ways of thinking about data. So what, um, 
what record format do they use, right? MapReduce presents things to you as a set of keys and values. Pig gives you a tuple. Hive gives you a record. Pig, re, tuple and record are just you know, different words for the same thing. The scientists who thought of pig were <coughs> um, had a lot of math backgrounds, so they tend to use mathy words like tuple and bag instead of databasey words like record and table, but they're really the same thing. Um, the data models, MapReduce doesn't really give you a data model. Right, it's kind of roll your own. You bring your data model to the table. Uh, PIG gives you basic types plus some more uh, some collection types like maps and tuples and bags. Hive, same thing, gives you a set of basic types plus those collection types. Um, but now when we get to these lower ones, on the schema, MapReduce, you have to just encode that in your app. Right? The PIG ends up being in your inside your job code given what that schema is. PIG, in general, it's the same thing. You either have to declare it in a script or some loaders can actually read it. Um, for example, the JSON loader or in the latest pig stuff, pig scheme, uh, even the pig storage can read the schema if it already has it, but um, often you don't know that. And so you end up again encoding it in your app. And then finally, Hive, though, has a metadata store, right? It can read this, it can store this information. Same is true of data location and data format. These things in MapReduce and Pig end up getting encoded into your scripts. And this is this leads to not easy maintainability, right? Schemas evolve all the time. If every time your schema changes, you have to go rewrite your um, Pig Latin script or your MapReduce code, that's a pain in the rear. Because not only do you have to go back and you know, recompile the app, you have to go clear back through your test cycle, and you have to go back through the verification cycle. And that at a larger size company who's you know risk averse that can be a months long thing right i mean in, when we were at yahoo whenever we would make a change like this it would take months for it to work its way out into the production clusters the whole point of hadoop is to be agile and respond quickly and all these things and here we're we're not enabling that um okay so i think i went over all that so this beautifully colored picture here, um, shows you how the different applications on to access data that is stored inside HDFS when they're using to right? Um, so on the left, or yeah, your left, we have um, MapReduce and Green here, which uses input and output formats to talk directly to HDFS. Of course, those can be used to talk to other systems as well, but HDFS is the default, right? Um, Pig uh, pretty much uses that same system. It has a load and store function that sits on top of that input and output format to handle the translation from key value pairs to tuples, but it's a pretty thin layer. Hive also has its SERTI, which it again uses to sit on top of input and output format, but it has this one other piece, this Metastore client here, right, which is where it stores all this information it knows about the data. What's the schema? What's its format? Is it compressed? All these kinds of useful things. So, to some basic level, one of the first things that it does is it redraws that picture to look like this. So, it provides an input and output format here for MapReduce, and it provides a load and store function for Pig, so that all three of these tools can now access data from the same. Uh, from this Metastore and from HDFS, right? So this has um, several effects. The first one is it changes this table quite a bit, right? So now you see the pig and MapReduce, their columns look a lot more like hives. Um, they can now read their schema from this metadata store. They now are abstracted away from what is the um, Where's the data stored? What's the data format? So, Pig and MapReduce can now think, basically what it means is they can now think in terms of tables instead of in terms of files, right? So instead of needing to think in terms of, you know, my data is in slash data slash um, me slash today, I can just think, hey, my data is in this table that I own, right? This is one of the first big things that HCAT does. So, 
I want to walk through a couple quick examples of how this changes Pagan Mapper so you get a feel for, for what this actually means when you're writing your code. So um, if you're not a you know experienced pig user, don't worry, I don't think this excuse me, I don't think this pig Latin's too too hard to follow. And then there'll be a MapReduce example too if you're more comfortable in the MapReduce world. But basically this is a um, this is a pig Latin script that loads a file called data raw events 2012-0530. So assumably this is some stream of data called raw events. It's probably the data you're bringing in raw from whatever your system is. Um, and it's one way to reference <coughs> the data from May 30th of this year. Notice right after that load statement, you're, you end up needing to declare the schema. There's two fields in this data, one called URL and one called user. Then you're going to filter this through this user defined function here that's called not a bot, which assumably is something that detects automatic, you know, uh, robotic users inside your data. In, in the web world, a bot is something like Google's crawlers or some of those things that crawl around the web and um, access lots and lots of pages, but you don't really usually want to count those, right? Those aren't interesting because they're not really users and you can't go charge Google for letting it spiders crawl across your pages. In fact, you want them to crawl across your pages because you want them to index them. Um, then you're going to group uh, this resulting data set by both um, user and URL, and you're going to count how many, um, you're going to count the resulting number of records per user URL combination, and then you're going to store this into a table called counted, again, with today's date to mark it off from other days, right? So that's what this Pig Latin script does. So let's take a look at what how each catalog modifies that. So this is what you would, the script would look like if you wrote with each catalog. Um, as I pointed out before, now we're just floating it from a table called raw events. Right? You don't need to know that file name anymore. And you don't need to declare the schema. So each cat loader can communicate the schema to pig directly from the meta store. There's no need for you to say, oh, this is what the schema is. Um, and you can still do the partition pruning here inside this filter. You can still put in there, I only want the data for May 30th of this year. And Pig is smart enough to split that filter out of that line and push it up into the loader and make sure you only read the part of the table you need, right? So you're not doing a full table scan here. You're still, you're reading exactly the same amount of data you would read in the previous, uh, previous example. So let's look at the same thing inside MapReduce. So this is, um, if you're using HCAT input format, you declare that as your input format, you're going to do all the normal things you do in your MapReduce code when you're setting up. And you're going to declare what your input format is. And then you're going to make one call here on HCAT input format. It's called set input. And you're going to tell it what database to read from. So um, I have an H catalog declare, um, have a three, have just a two-level scheme. Uh, many of you, if you're used to Oracle, may be used to the three-level schema catalog table um, scheme. Uh, in Hive and H catalog, schema and catalog mean the same thing. In fact, they're, or sorry, schema and database, not schema and catalog. Schema and database mean the same thing and are kind of merged into the same concept. So I tend to call that a database. Um, you could, Hive actually lets you call it a schema as well, but whatever. At this level, you declare that. If you, if you leave that null, you'll get the default database, which is what almost everybody who uses it does. Um, you're going to declare what table you want to read from. And then if you don't want to read the whole table, you're going to declare a filter that defines your partition. So this filter must be on a partitioning column. right? You can't just say, oh, and I want the user column to not be null. It doesn't. Um, we, we don't get pushed down generic predicates. We only push down filtering predicates. Um, in, in a similar way, if you want to store to H catalog in MapReduce, you're going to do a set output. A lot of this looks the same. The one difference here is if you're going to write a particular partition, you need to specify the partition columns for that partition. Right. So if your table is is partitioned by date, as in the pre as in the pig example, and you're only going to st store a partition for one day. You can declare it right here. Now, if you want to store more than one partition at a time in either pig or uh, MapReduce, you can leave this value null, and then 
as long as that the partitioning columns are present in your data, each catalog will handle appropriately spraying it out across multiple partitions and commit them all at once or not, as depending on how the job goes. Um, from inside your your MapReduce program, you can get the schema. Oddly enough, we call it the function get output schema, which means the output from each catalog, not the output from your program. That's probably not one of our better function naming exercises on display right there. Um, but this will give you the schema of the data you are reading from each catalog. And when when you're reading data or writing data in MapReduce, you use keys and values. So in this particular case, the key is unused. We just ignore it. The value is a class called HCAT record that we have um, added for this purpose. It gives you, each catalog record is an ordered list with getters and setters, very similar to Hive's record or pig's tuple, right? Um, and it allows you to access fields either by position or by name. Uh, accessing by name is particularly useful because if somebody decides to reorder your records for whatever reason, right, you're insulated from that. You're just saying, I want the URL, I don't really care where it is. Now you notice you have to pass the schema along to the name because for efficiency reasons we don't store the schema with every record, right, that would cost us an extra pointer in Java, which is another um, four bytes. And we want to jam as much in memory as we can so we don't do that. Okay, so a fair question now is how does this relate to Hive? Right? I kind of made some allusions to the fact that it's related to Hive, and it's Hive already has a meta store, so what what's the relationship here? Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the architecture a little more in a minute, but the the key thing here is this is just Hive's meta store with adapters and pieces around it to make it work with other tools. Right? So Pig and Map producer, some of those later in the talk I'll show you some more adapters that we have to make it work with systems on the outside. But the, the key thing here is Hive doesn't perceive H catalog as a foreign thing. You don't if you're already a Hive user, there's you don't have to connect it to H catalog if you want to use Hive and Pig or Hive and MapReduce or whatever for this. It, Hive will just perceive all this as part of itself, right? It is just Hive's best store. Um, as shown in the previous pictures, we use Hive Certies to do the data translation. So um, that also makes it integrate very nicely. And the, the data definition language, which is the way you create tables, alter tables, all that kind of stuff, is just Hive's uh, DDL. So there's no, no issues there. Um, if you're not a Hive user and you want to use this, we do provide a command line so that you can uh, you can use it. You don't have to install Hive if you if you don't want to. Um, again, it uses the same DDL. And then starting in Pig 0.11, which I do not have the release date for because we haven't planned it yet, you'll actually be able to issue these DDL commands in Pig as well. Pig itself will also be able to directly connect, and you'll be able to say create table and that kind of stuff. So that um, if you have a Pig Latin script that needs to create a table and load a bunch of data into it, something like that will be <coughs> Um, one difference here is we do, HCatalog does provide an alternate security implementation as compared to Hive. So Hive has the beginnings of a traditional database um, security system. It's not all there yet just because they haven't finished it. But there's also some challenges to, to implementing a traditional database security system on top of Hive just because of the fact that Hive is not totally in control of the Hadoop world, right? I can go to Hive and I can say revoke access to my table, you know, revoke your access to my table, so you can't go read my data. But since it's just ultimately an HDFS file, you can go underneath Hive and go read that HDFS file, right? Not, you know, I haven't really accomplished much. That's not security, at least not where I come from. Um, now you can fix that by saying, well, Hive will own all the data. And some there'll be some user Hive and we'll make that user own all the data. And then when I revoke your access in Hive, it'll truly be revoked. But that, that brings up another problem, which is um, almost, well, with HCatalog here, if you can use PIG and, and MapReduce, by definition, I'm now injecting code into the system, right? My user-defined functions in PIG, my MapReduce code, 
and user-defined functions you have in Hive will now have access to that data as a super user. You've effectively created every, you're effectively now running every user-defined function as a super user, which is um, not secure, right? So you may be, able, you know, I might be able to revoke access to my table through Hive, but you could write a UDF, run it against your own table, and inside that UDF, scoot underneath and grab my data or do whatever evil things you want to do to it, right? So the Hadoop world, the Hadoop world presents some security challenges that maybe a traditional database doesn't have or that they deal with a little differently. To get around that for the moment, what we've done in H catalog is say all our security is delegated to the underlying storage. So at this point, when if a user um, wants access to a table, we look at the directory on HDFS where all that uh, table, where all the data for that table is stored, and we say, would they have access to read this data? If yes, then we'll let them read the schema for this table. If no, then we won't. Um, you know, if they want to write something to that table, we'll. If they say they want to do an alter on the table, they want to change the schema. We'll again look at that directory and say, would you have access to write? into this, if yes, then we'll let you change the table. So the upside of that is it actually works. Um, you know, it is secure, you really, you know, if you can't mess with the data, you can't mess with the metadata. The downside, of course, is it's a much poorer model. Um, poorer in terms of feature poor. Right now I'm, I'm gluing myself to POSIX semantics instead of the much richer uh, database security semantics that you might be used to. In time, I think we'll see those two move together, but we need to find a way that does it in a way that actually respects security. Okay, so let me switch to a kind of an architecture diagram of how these two fit together. Maybe this will help you <coughs> see a little bit more. So um, on the far right here, we have the relational database that Hive stores its metadata in. Um, I think Derby is what it actually uses out of the box. That's really just for kind of getting up and going realistically. Almost everybody uses MySQL. You can't, uh, some people do use Postgres, people will play with you using Oracle. Um, you can certainly put other um, databases in here. There's nothing magic about the SQL that's going on here, but MySQL is kind of the biggest one, so I use that. Um, and then in the middle we have the Hive Metastore server. This is a thrift server that takes calls from uh, Hive clients, um, and now with HCatalog can also take calls from Pig and MapReduce and do those metadata operations, right? So those of you who are familiar with Hive will recognize that you don't have to run Hive in this model. You, it, it, there, it is possible to eliminate that box in the middle and connect your Hive client directly to MySQL. Um, as far as I know, HCatalog probably works if you do that, um, <coughs> because you know, the, the connectors that are inside the HCat loader and store and the input and output formats would connect to MySQL that's the same. We don't recommend that model though, because in order to do that, you have to send the password to MySQL to every client. And they have, it has to be in plain text in their config file. So we don't actually recommend that model. We don't see that as um, secure. Okay, so I've spent all my time so far on all the stuff all the ways that H Catalog connects tools inside the dude, but that's only half the story, right? Um, there are a bazillion data tools already out there in the world. And as wonderful as we think Hadoop is, we don't have the illusions that it's gonna replace all the other tools, right? It's, we hope it's gonna take its place in the data ecosystem as an important, um, in fact, we even hope indispensable tool, but that doesn't mean any of the other tools are going away. Right? There's going to be a lot of other things in the system there to interconnect with. Um, so how do we connect Hadoop to those other tools? One of, those things, one of the things that a lot of those other tools want is an understanding of what's in the system. And it turns out a lot of those tools are used to thinking about data sources as a collection of tables. It's a really nice abstraction for relational databases. It's a really nice abstraction for uh, reporting tools. Uh, all these kind of systems it, it works really well with. So we have added a REST interface on top of this to make it easy for those for these things to integrate. Um, we're now calling it WebHCAT. You may have heard of this uh, as Templeton in the past. So um, when we first 
built it. We uh, call it Templeton because for any of you who've read Charlotte's Web, Templeton is the rat that helps the pig and helps Charlotte on her web. And so it seemed like a, just a great, you know, kind of connection point for all of it. But uh, as I said, my goals to name a, a project have again been frustrated. So now we're calling it WebHCAT to show that it's part of H catalog instead of its own standalone thing that's causing confusion because people thought it was a whole different project doing totally different things, which isn't what we wanted. So um, what does this thing do? What this does is defines the metadata inside your system as a set of REST endpoints. Right? So now databases, tables, partitions, columns, and table properties inside your Metastore can all be viewed as endpoints in a REST service. And then the traditional REST verbs apply. Right? You're going to do a put to create or update this data. You're going to do a get to list or describe it. And you're going to do a delete to draw these things. Right? So um, now you get to see some beautiful PowerPoint art here on kind of how this, what this looks like. So envision, you know, here's some user with his laptop wanting to communicate with the Hadoop system, figure out what's in there. So first of all, we're going to try to figure out what are all the tables in the default database? Is the table I want, is it already there? Right? So what you do with that is you send a git to this web address here. So I left out some stuff on the left side just so it would fit in, but you could say something like you know, acme.hadoop.com slash templeton, and then it'll go like this. So we versioned it just to make sure you know, we're pretty certain that we didn't get it 100% right the first time. So there'll be a version two and three, but this way we can support, you know, not break the existing clients when we make those changes. Then you say, I want to do a DDL operation. I want it in my database is default. And then if you just say table, this will get you back a list of tables, right? So what's going to come back is a nice little JSON document that says, we have two tables in this database, one called counted and one called processed. And that's what's in, you know, that's the list of tables. You decide, oh, that's neither of those are the table I wanted, so I'm going to now um, create a new table called raw events. So you're again going to do an HTTP call with a very similar address, only this time you're going to add the name raw events on the end. This is the table you want to create, and you're going to send a, a JSON document that says, I have, I want to put two column, I want this table to have two columns, one called name and one, or sorry, one called URL and one called user. And I'm going to partition this table by a field called uh, DS for date spanning. Right? And so this is all you have to do. And assuming it all goes well, you get back something that just says, I created this table called Robins in the database default. And then finally, you can describe this same table with a git, and this time putting raw events on the end of the URL so that you're directly accessing that point. And you'll get back a similar looking document um, that describes that table. Um, so this WebHCAT stuff is included in, already included, included in HTTP, which is Hortonworks distribution of Hadoop. It is not in the released version of HCatalog 0.4, but it has been checked in the trunk and will be part of HCatalog 0.5. So if you just go to Apache and download the existing release, you won't get this. Um, you could download it from the trunk and integrate it with the existing 0.4. You can download it from us and do it all put in there already. Um, all right, so let me pause briefly from the technical side and just talk a little bit about where each catalog is at as a project. Um, each of these different tools inside Hadoop is a separate Apache project, HCatalog is no exception. So we are still in the incubator. Excuse me, often people are confused by this and they think that means the code's really immature or it's kind of not ready for real time or something. That isn't what incubator means. Incubator actually has nothing to do with code quality or um, technical project status at Apache. Incubator just means it's a newer community and the people who are in that community are still being mentored in the Apache way to make sure that when they graduate, they're able to, um, you know, that they have a healthy, successful project. It's, um, you know, you can think of it as uh, kind of like when you get a learner's permit when you're learning to drive, right? You're, you're just getting, you're being taught how to how to drive, how to be a good citizen, all those kinds of things. That's the same thing as it. So, 
I think actually each catalog, I suspect, will graduate very soon. In our last review, the, um, the powers that be in the incubator said they thought we were about ready to graduate, so we probably will. Um, we released version 0.4 of H catalog last May, and this has the Hive Pig Map Reduce integration that I already showed you, so that's actually already out there and running. Um, it supports any data format where there's already a SERTI. So if you have, if you're using Hive already, you know, SERTIs for your data format, that will just work. Um, by default, it comes with SERTIs for text files, sequence files, RC files, um, and text files that are JSONs. I said text over here, I really should say CSV, so any, any kind of character delimited uh, file is what I mean by text. And then we also support uh, JSON as a, um, as a format there. Um, and I believe there's been a lot of work lately on Avro 32, so if you're an Avro user, that should also work here. Um, one feature that I haven't talked about is HCatalog also supports notification for arrival of new data via GM JMS. So if you have a workflow system that you want to connect to this, and you rather than sitting there and polling and trying to find out is my data there, is my data there, which really isn't very good for anybody, um, you can subscribe to a topic on JMS and it will just tell you, hey, a new partition has arrived and you can go start your data. Um, we've also done some initial work on integrating this with HBase so that you can um, front an HBase table with an H catalog table. This works using the uh, storage handlers the same way that Hive does this. <coughs> um, I say this is initial because it, it's there and it works, but it's got a lot of rough spots at this point and I you know, if I wanted to use this in production, I, I think this is something I'd beat on for a while and really kind of work some of the bugs out before I, I put production quality work in data or dependencies on it. Um, all right, so let me talk a little bit about kind of what we're doing right now, what things we're working on, things we want to work on. So, um, and when I Say we here, this is both, this is we in a couple of dimensions, right? So there's what we at Hortworks are working on, and that's actually what I'll show you some slides on our, there, I mean, there are other people in the Hive, or sorry, the Asian Catalog community, there's Yahoo and Twitter are both contributing to it. Um, I'll mention some of the work they're doing as well, but um, the stuff I'm gonna show you on these slides is more what, what Hortworks is working on right at the moment. So one of the first things here is improving the security. I talked about, um, you know, there's some Still, some rough spots from the security model. Um, for starters, Hive <coughs> checks security on a number of operations. So, it actually turns out in Hive that while you may be able to revoke my ability to access your table, I can grant it back to myself with no way to prevent that. So, there's no grant controls. I can grant myself anything. Um, and I say that tongue in cheek, but I'm not really picking on Hive. Um, it, you know, it's just, it's a work in progress and it's, it's not done yet. So when we'd like to work with Hive to, to solve some of those, because as long as those security concerns exist in Hive, they'll exist for us in each catalog as well. Um, also in that diagram I showed you, um, the, um, the Hive Metastore down here that's boxed in red right at the moment. Actually all the security in Hive right now is on, checks are all done on the client side. So it would actually be feasible for me to write a malicious client that would circumvent all the security and go to that server, and the server would, would not really complain about it. So that's another thing we need to, you know, we're working on solving is we want to move those security checks into the server so that we, you know, you can write all the malicious clients you want and we'll say, nope, sorry, can't do that. Um, and then uh, grant revoke operations also just don't work properly with HCAT right now, so Hive, um, Hive has a very nice authorization interface where it will let you do alternate implementations of authorization. That's how HCatalog does its security work. Unfortunately, that interface doesn't include the ability to specify operations that work differently, like grant and revoke. So grant and revoke actually do the wrong things right now if you try to use them with HCatalog, so we need to repair that. And then another thing that we're working on actively at the moment is um, that red box in the middle, this high Metastore server, is a single point of failure right at the moment. There, this is not um, highly available. Um, we'd like to solve that, and we want to make that a highly available part of the system so that if 
one, you know, one of your boxes goes up in flames, it doesn't mean that all your access to metadata is done. Um, we are not proposing to solve anytime soon, or probably ever, high availability for the MySQL on the right side there. Right? There are lots of solutions. Whatever your favorite database is, there's lots of high HA solutions for that, and we would prefer to you know, let people pick their HA solutions. Realistically, we find almost everybody that already has a database has an HA solution, they'll just apply it again here. Right? Yes? Is there, is there a direction to actually take the security down uh, to the column level, uh, or are you just keeping it at the table level? Um, in, the, in the immediate term, in this term, it will be just at the, ta at the table level. I think in the long term, people definitely want it at the column level. Well, I know they want it at the column level, right? The column and row, because they're used to that from Oracle. Um, the question is how to achieve that inside the framework of your files being in HDFS, where it's harder to parse out what parts of a file you can read. I mean, what you realistically mean there is you have to change, um, well, you, you have a couple options. You can either drive that level of security into HDFS itself, or you can switch to a model where you say, there's a whole set of files that no one can touch anyway except through this metadata system, right? You just lock them off and say there's no ability to read files all access is controlled through this. Which of those we'll choose, I don't know. We, we have debates back and forth. In fact, I just this Monday had a long whiteboard talk with a colleague on thoughts of which way we should go with this. So, yeah, I think we'll get there, but I don't have a roadmap for when or how yet. follow-up to that. Um, in, in terms of the direct, how, how rich are you planning to make this, uh, this metadata layer? Because right now it's, it's sort of a catalog, catalog of mm -hmm. everything you right? uh, So, you know, one, one, one of the, one of the uh, questions that clients ask us is, uh, you know, for the last 10 years, we've said, take uh, <coughs> your uh, transformations out of your, uh, out of your PNC code scripts. Put in the ETL because now you can expose the metadata. Right. right. And uh, with uh, Hadoop, you're sort of going in the other direction, you're going into big data, uh, high queries and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, is there is there an approach to actually make the hedge catalog richer so that they hold the remaining metadata as well? Sure. So, um, partially. So, what well, we definitely know that people want to be able to annotate their tables, their partitions, their columns with data, with metadata, sorry. And we want to enable that, right? And in fact, you can't already annotate your tables. Um, that is supported today. Um, we want to figure out how to allow annotation of partitions and columns and stuff without overwhelming the operational system, right? I mean, this is a live system serving potentially hundreds of customers simultaneously, so we need to figure out how to mix the load of all those customers now not just saying, where is my data, but here's the 50 tags I want to put on top of it, right? So there's some logistics there. We do want to enable that. However, when you look at, like you mentioned, the metadata systems that exist inside um, things like Informatica, there's other um, metadata tools that are even richer than that. I mean, those are very sophisticated tools. Our vision is not to replicate that level stuff, right? I mean, our vision is to have the right interfaces to enable those tools to work with us. And those tools may choose to store the data inside us for their convenience, and we're fine with that. But we, we see our um, core competency as working with the Hadoop system and what it needs, not necessarily presenting those add-on values of additional metadata the way, like, if, you know, that's, that's the core competency of companies like Informatica, right? So that's has been our approach is let's make sure we have the right interfaces to enable those guys, but let's not try to eat their lunch. Right? We'd rather be their friends. And I, well, I don't even I don't just mean that in a in a businessy way. I mean even in a technical way, I'm a strong, strong believer in have a tool that does something and does it well, rather than try to I, I do not believe in the one tool to rule them all theory of software. And I know that differentiates my thinking from you know, some other there are companies that I think that's the right way to go. You can see that out in the marketplace. Um, but that's been kind of our take, is it's better to build those clear APIs and let people innovate on top of that. Um, okay, 
So one other area of current work that I want to talk a little bit about is um, connectivity via ODBC and JDBC. And this wanders some into the Hive area as well, so I'm, I'm blurring these lines very seriously now between um, page catalog and Hive. And, but I, I'm doing it for a reason here. So um, <coughs> this is the story today with using ODBC or JDBC with Hive. There's a, excuse me, there's a system called Hive Server that you can connect an ODBC client or a JDBC client to. There are open source instances of both of these, as well as at least for the ODBC server, some proprietary editions. Um, but there's some issues with this. Oh, and sorry, with the JDBC driver, you can actually install Hive on your system and directly connect it. You don't need the Hive server. But that sort of defeats the purpose of a JDBC driver if you're saying, I now have to install this big old fat long software onto my system. And now, when I change versions, I've got an um, ops nightmare because everybody out there in the world has to install a new version of Hive on their laptop or whatever it is they're connecting to. So this kind of isn't, you know, this is sort of a violation of the ODBC, or sorry, JDBC model. Um, the open source version of the ODBC client, I don't know of anybody who's using this, which makes me suspect it doesn't actually work. Right? Um, in, in open source, if you know, code rots, I suppose, in <coughs> closed source too, but in open source, the way you detect code rot is no patches, no bugs, no mailing list questions, right? That tends to mean, okay, nobody's using this and it's probably not really out there and going. Um, Hive server itself has a series of issues as well. It's um, single threaded. You can't, well, this is only sort of true. The, um, the, uh, Thrift server is multi-threaded, but Hive itself is not thread safe. So yeah, it's not safe to use in concurrent mode. It's not secure. Um, it doesn't check security. It doesn't actually even check users. And it um, it does not, uh, oh, and it runs user code inside itself, right? So you can write a malicious UDF with a static block that does some nasty things. It would get instantiated inside that server and you could potentially Corrupt or take down the server, and then um, the I said not scalable. That's only a semi-defensible statement, actually. When I think hard about it, you can instantiate more than one Hive server, so it is in that sense scalable. It is not easy to scale. It, you can't. It doesn't dynamically just install more of itself. You would have to manually go out and say, "Oh, I need another Hive server. I need another Hive server." So you could end up. It's a situation where you have lots and lots of these things running to meet your, you know, however many ODBC or JDBC connections you think you might have. So we propose to change this picture as follows. Um, the Templeton slash WebHCAT stuff that I showed you, um, beyond having connections or the ability to do DDL, it actually also does, um, you can do job submission and management through it. So it has interfaces where you can submit pig hive or MapReduce jobs monitor those jobs, kill them, get the results, all that kind of stuff. That's already there inside the interface. So we propose to rework our, um, the J, or not rework, but really write new instances of the JDBC and ODBC client that will um, work over that and it will be robust and open source, right? So we wanna, this is one of those areas where we feel like it's important that these connectors be out in the open, they not be proprietary um, or, that kind of stuff, so we want to rework these and get them out there in the open. Um, this REST server that's there already exists, already spawns job in, inside the cluster. This deals with a lot of scalability concerns and concurrency, deals with security because um, Hadoop already supports security, Hadoop already handles the fact that you've got user code running inside a task and how to manage that. Um, when it runs a job, it submits it as the user running it, not as itself server and at the end of the day this is a web server and if you need to scale it that's a pretty well understood problem right it's, that's 10 year old technology or whatever now 15 20 year old technology we've been scaling web servers for for a long long time we know how to do that okay um, other future work so that I didn't put a slide in here but that's the break between things we're actively truly working on right at the moment and things that we'd um, 
you know, want to be doing in the near future. So another area that we want to be working on in the near future is reading and writing data in parallel. So one thing that we find a lot of users want to do is they have other multiprocessor data systems, pick your favorite MPP database, they want to sit next to Hadoop and they want to be able to exchange data back and forth between these things, right? It's a very reasonable thing they want to be able to do. Um, you can't really plug two massively parallel systems together through an ODBC pipe. You know, that's like you've got, you know, two, uh, it's as if you want to drain Lake Michigan into Lake Superior with a straw or something, right? It's just not the right approach to take. If you're going to do that, you need lots and lots of pipes. Um, so now there are already some tools to do this, and which are good for the use cases that they're there for. So what is there today? Um, WebHDFS exists, which is a REST interface to connect to HDFS and move data in and out. Um, you can do it in parallel because the um, Web HDFS calls are actually redirected to the data nodes that actually have the data. So you're not, there isn't a, any single point there. So if your system can handle 100 simultaneous uh, pipes and you have 100 nodes in your Hadoop cluster, no problem. And you can line those up, you can move data. Um, the downside of that is you're just moving bytes, right? So if we imagine you have your favorite MPP data store, and it wants to just suck bytes out of Hadoop, now it has to understand our formats, right? If you're just storing data in JSON or CSV or something like that, that's probably fine. If you're using sequence file or RC file or protocol buffers or whatever, you know, binary pack decimal, whatever your favorite thing is, that's probably not a great thing, right? Because now you're ending up writing new code to translate that. Another tool that works in this space is Scoop. Scoop's a fine tool for what it does, which is it's really focused on let's find a bunch of data in a, a system external to Hadoop, suck it into Hadoop, process it, and then you may use it again to push data out. So Scoop works fine for that kind of case. The case that we want to address is really the inverse of that. So in the Scoop case, Hadoop is driving the parallelism and Hadoop is driving the job because you're pulling data into and out of Hadoop. What we want to help address is the inverse, where it's the external system that's driving that, right? So <coughs> envision that you're some MPP data store, somebody, and what you do is you store all of the current month's data in your tables, right? But you really, but your users occasionally, only very occasionally, want to access the last 12 months worth of data. You can't afford to store all that in your, your data store. It's, you know, they, they just charge you too much money to keep that much data on their disks. So what you do is you put one month in them, you put the 11 months in do, but we want to make it so that when a user comes to that and says, show me all 12 months data, they don't have to know to go around to Hadoop, right? They can still ask your, your data store, it can come to Hadoop and pull that data in, in parallel, right? So this is, that's how the inverse. So here, it's kind of an idea what that looks like. So on the right, in green, we have uh, Hadoop with MHDFS and HCatalog. On the left, we have whatever your favorite MPP system is, which we're going to assume has some kind of master-slave setup. So um, we've added these interfaces called HCAT Reader and HCAT Writer to help manage this. And I'll just walk through what it looks like on the read side. It's pretty similar on the right side. So in this case, the master node here can come to HCatalog and say, give me an HCatalog reader. Um, and inside this, they would specify, here's the table I want to read, here's the partitions of that table, very similar to what you would do in that previous job, right? You're going to tell it what you want to read and what parts. And each catalog is going to pass back an instance of this HCAF reader class. Um, the master can then distribute that to their slaves as it sees fit in, in the way that fits their system, right? Uh, Hadoop doesn't understand their parallelism, so it makes sense for them to do this split. Each slave can then um, read directly from HDFS with no need to connect through HCatalog there. And the important part here is instead of getting back bytes, they're now getting back an HCAT record, the same interface that MapReduce gets. So now your system is able to read in with read records, basically, instead of bytes. Now you don't have to care about how we're storing it. Right? 
You can also do things through this like partition, or I'm sorry, uh, projection push down, right? So if you only need four columns, you can push that down and you're only having to read that data out, assuming this is if you've got some kind of column or format or whatever. The, um, the downside is all this exists right now, but it's only in Java, which isn't, I mean, it's a nice start, but what you actually want is for this to be in REST, right? Just like the, the other page catalog interfaces for external systems, because the reality is most of these data processing systems are in C or C++. Um, actually, most of them are in C. They're, you know, most of them are from the days before real programs were in C++. Um, and certainly, you know, Java would never have been considered for systems programming 15 years ago when most of these systems were being written. Um, so this is something we've actually taken a start at, but we feel like there's a lot more work here to really flesh this out, but it, this is something that everywhere I go and talk to users of existing MPP systems, they're all like, we need this, we need this, we need this, right? It's pretty clear what people want. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Just to serialize it in uh, and Slave, you have to serialize this faithful object, HTAP, pretty clear. What's, what's the, even in Java, what's the API support? The supports internal is on your representation of this? Um, so at the moment, what it, it just serializes the class, and then when the slave does that read, it passes that back, and that's interpreted. Or, well, sorry, it doesn't pass it back. It's, I mean, the slave is connecting to some library here that interprets that class and translates that into a set of what files to read, right? So um, what we have, what, inside that HCAP reader is a, an array of what, what we call splits inside the Hadoop. So maybe you get back 100 splits. It's then up to that master and they can say give 33 to two and 34 to one, for example. And then you would, that's what they would send to the slaves and then they would read that. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, another area that we feel like we need to do some work. Um, so one of Hadoop's great strengths is that it works with unstructured or semi-structured data. Um, I don't actually like those terms because most data is some kind of structure, but it's the terms people are using, so I'll just complain about it and keep using them. Um, but basically the idea is this. When they say structured data, what they tend to mean is relational data. Right? It's well-organized in the table. Semi-structured, in my experience, tends to mean um, data with structure that is non-relational. You know, it has lists or or collections, or arrays, or hash maps, or something like that embedded in it, right? That tends to get called semi-structured. Strikes me as weird, because it's definitely structured. It's just not a structured relational system knows what to do with in a nice way. Newer relational systems can deal with it, but it's not a traditional relational structure. It's not something that meets uh, the traditional normal forms. Um, another way that data can be semi-structured, or sometimes this is unstructured, I guess, is certain uh, fields may or may not be there, right? That's very common. If you think of, you go do a web crawl, right? You're gonna crawl a bunch of pages on the web. Um, they'll probably, well, all of them by definition will have a URL, we got there somehow. 99% of them are gonna have some kind of content on that page, right? Some of them will have links, some won't. Some of them will have titles, some won't. Some will have author tags or whatever, some won't, right? So you're gonna have, your records are gonna be different from field to field. Now, of course, you can just fill in nulls for all those. That's the traditional data, relational way to do things. Um, you know, often if you look at log files or whatever coming out of Apache or things coming out of web crawls, they don't do that. They just omit the fields that aren't there. Um, we'd like our systems to be able to handle all those cases. Right? We don't want to say, well, we only work on relational data. A lot of the promise of the do is the fact that we can get all this less structured data or differently structured data. So, Without each catalog, the picture kind of looks like this. On the left, or, yeah, sorry, left here we have um, tables, which you can read with SQL queries, aka Hive. On the right, we have semi-structured data, which traditionally pigs don't just find them, right? Pig, uh, one of pigs' mantras is that pigs eat anything. It's just fine with, you know, if there's if the data is missing. That really is part of we, when we started the pig project. We sat down and wrote. The philosophical tenets of pig. Pigs eat anything is one of our tenets. So, um, when starting an open source project, it's actually really good to have a you know, guiding 
philosophy. So that is part of ours. Um, okay, so what have we done with H catalog? With H catalog, we've changed it to the picture to look like this. So now the systems on the right, like Pig and MapReduce, that can manage unstructured data, we've also made it very nice for them to manage structured data as well. This is, this is a good thing. Um, a lot of data is structured. A lot of people take in unstructured data and munge it until they get it to some structured format, right? So we've opened up some things here. But this is not the full promise of where we want to end up. We want, we want arrows going everywhere. Um, we want users of Hive and users of Pig who still want to think in tables to also be able to manage the fact that this um, data may or may not be there. Now, you can do this today with Hive and H catalog if you know the right tricks to play with it. But we want to put in the right interfaces to make this nice to do, right? Envision if, say you had a collection of JSON documents that, that represented some data crawl you'd done, and you needed to, um, you wanted to go over, the, over that data using Hive. And you, know, you, you didn't know whether every document in there had a, had a tag called author or not. Some do, some don't, right? You would like to be able to say things like, I assert for the purposes of this query that it does have an author field. And if it doesn't, maybe fill in a null there. Or if it doesn't, maybe just discard this record if you're not interested in anything that doesn't have an author field. You can certainly, um, you can write a SQL query that does all those things. Um, but we want to basically work with the interfaces in such well enough that this is all happens very naturally and easily. So you might do something like create a temporary view that asserts how you want to see this, uh, this data and then run the query and each catalog just manages the fact where you know, the records that don't quite match, it, it either massages them to the point that they do match, or throws them out, whatever you, know, whatever you specify. This is another area that we feel is very important. Um, finally, um, for new features, um, one thing that there is not any standard tool set yet for in Hadoop is what uh, is often called data lifecycle management or information lifecycle management. Right? Um, right now, in all honesty, a lot of people's Hadoop clusters look like my garage. They just grow more and more crud. Right? You just keep jamming stuff in there, and it, you know somehow cleaning day never quite arrives. Um, until it's coming out the doors and there's like this, oh my gosh, I've got to do something now, but I don't even know what to throw away, right? I go in there and I look and there's this box after box and it's like, what's in this box? Should I, can I throw this away or is this something I actually care about? Um, there aren't a standard set of tools to solve this problem for a dude, right? But yet you want to be able to do these kinds of things. You want to be able to clean out the data, right? Data lives for some certain period of time and then pretty soon it's time to get rid of it. And what that time is depends on legal things, depends on company practices, depends on all kinds of things. You need to be able to define that in your system and have it control when the data goes away. Um, you may want to archive your data. Now, honestly, I put a tape machine there. I'm trying to archive that new cluster to a tape machine. <laughs> Probably kind of nuts, but um, works for the picture. Um, but somehow, you know, for legal requirements or whatever, you, you may want to stick this in some kind of cold storage for 10 years because the government may be telling you, you know, you have to keep your original data sets for up to 10 years so that we can audit it if we need to. Um, most people find that they want more than one Hadoop cluster for their system. If nothing else, you want to put one in two geographically distributed locations, right? Because one of these days, the San Andreas Fault really is going to go off and <coughs> those data centers in California are going to be offline for a while. And that means you want to have a data center on the East Coast somewhere, um, or Central U.S. somewhere, or somewhere not on the San Andreas Fault. There's a great place in Central Illinois where two different power grids meet, and all, everybody builds their data centers there. So then if either power grid goes out, they die? Uh, <laughs> just inverse well, all no, the they, they're plugged into both. Oh, they plug into both, okay. So if one goes down, the other one's still on. And I okay. think one is nuclear, and the other one is, is uh, fossil. <laughs> okay. On the West Coast, a lot of people actually are putting their data centers now in eastern Washington and eastern Oregon because 
there's two things up there. There's Hanford, which is the big nuclear plant, and there's um, Hydro. There's the, the big dams. And so they can put them next to those huge dams on the Columbia River. The other advantage is it's about 10 degrees outside most of the time in the winter there, so you can just throw the doors open and forget about the air conditioning. <laughs> and they really do. They build, well, I've heard they're actually building some of those in Michigan, I think, too, where they do, I think it was Google was building some of those where they do adaptive, like the air conditioner system figures out when it's cold enough outside that it can turn itself off and just open that would the work doors in the as well. I'm, yeah, I think it would probably work in most of the north, north central U.S. Right? <laughs> if it's cold enough. So um, anyway, that's a total like. Uh, the point is, you want to you want to be able to replicate your data between these systems, right? For um, this may be for disaster recovery, like I was talking about business, BCP, business continuity planning, or it may just be because you have different people working on different systems, but they have some shared data sets. Right? You have your scientists on one system, your analysts on another, but there's some base set of data they share, you want them to be able to that across, right? And finally, you want to be able to do compaction. Um, Hadoop has some technologies like HAR, which is, stands for Hadoop Archive, which lets you take a bunch of files and jam them into one file. It's about a 10 or 20 percent access speed cost, but you end up compacting the size and number of the equivalent of inodes. Who doesn't have inodes? But it's the same idea um, that they take up on your system. You can. You know, this is a great thing to do for colder data. I mean, if you think about it, if you're bringing in data every hour, the first day you probably are doing a lot of queries over that by day five or something. Probably all those queries are going after the full day's set. So the value of keeping it by hours is starting to drop, right? In that case, you might not even use HAR. You might even just restate the data into an hour, a daily feed, right? You might just take all 24 of those hours and jam, reprocess them into a single day. Um, you'd like to be able to do these kind of things. I don't see H Catalog providing all these. This is not, you know, we're not looking at it to be that kind of uh, life cycle management thing, but it needs to provide the right interfaces to enable this tool. Right now, if you wanted to write a cleaner, it wouldn't even be clear how to go about figuring out what data sets are ready to expire and what aren't, right? Each catalog needs to provide the right metadata and the right APIs to enable these tools, and probably provide small proof of concept instances of some of these just to make sure the APIs are actually useful, right? It's great to write an API, but if you don't test it against a real tool, you have no idea if it's the right API. So, we would probably have a small proof of concept, but again, this is another place where we don't necessarily want to get in this business, we want to enable others who will be in this business. Um, that's it for H Catalog. Questions about HCAT, about other Apache things, about Hardworks, about me, about whatever. How soon can you have that data lifecycle that we're ready for? How soon can we have the data lifecycle? Well, um, so. In all honesty, that's not something we're working on right now, just because it's not the thing people are screaming for the most. Um, if somebody wanted to come and work on it, we'd be very happy to help them. Um, guide it if, um, you know, if you want to pay somebody else to work on it, we'd be happy to work with them on it too. Right? So it's certainly something we're open to, but I, I can't say it's like scheduled for this week. But the thing about open source is I don't schedule it anyway, right? I, I lead one team at Hortonworks and I schedule what they work on, but that doesn't mean there aren't tons of other people. I mean, like um, Yahoo's doing all kinds of work right now to make Hadoop, uh, H Catalog work with Hadoop 2.0. Um, so, but, you know, so there's other people out there doing other things that I can't. So I, I don't know. I guess that's a big way of saying I have no idea. <laughs> Take my call for okay. Yeah, that's no. It's good feedback. I'm, it, one of the things that I love about these talks is a chance to hear what's important to people, right? Because most of the people I talk to are say that's a great idea, but what I really want is this. So it's good to hear someone who says that's a great idea and I want it now. Yes. Uh, for the current work we're doing now, so um, I am hoping to release at least first passes of all that stuff by the end of the year. So, um, the security work, the, um, the, the HA stuff, and the 
some some progress in the JVC or DVC I'm hoping to have out by the end of the year. So again, it's open source and I don't control all the schedules, but that's my current hoping. Which, which of the distributions have uh, uh, HTTP catalog? Uh, HTTP, Hortonworks data platform, has a catalog, and I, um, I have been told that MapR has adopted it. I do not know if that adoption means they've just said they will, or if that means they've actually released something with it. I know that they are supporting it to some extent because I've seen questions about it on their customer forums. So, um, though, strangely enough, MapR doesn't see fit to share their roadmap with me very often, so, um, <laughs> so I don't actually know when they're going to get to it. I know that Cloudera at this point does not support H catalog. I do not know if they plan on, again, they don't share their roadmap with me very often either. I don't know if they're planning on adding that sometime in the future. Sometimes I, I think customers see more roadmaps from everybody else than the actual vendors. Well, and of course, I'm sure those all work their way, you know, back. But um, you, you never know. You know, it, it's hard to tell what, what's where with some of those, right? So I'm sorry, I think you were still asking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does more than it does more than the schema. It, it it provides a record interface instead of a byte interface, right? Because all those things I showed you, you can do today with web H, with a combination of H catalog to find. So there's there's several things, right? You have to given a table, you have to figure out what files are in that table to break the table abstraction to get down to the files, and then you can use web HTFS to pull the files across. Does that, so, That's it for the first okay, but now I think you're going to have to re-ask me the second question because I'm not sure I follow. Yeah. See, that's not right, and that's not what I was proposing as a solution. What I'm instead proposing is that you, the user doesn't even realize the data is not in the MPP system. They issue a query against that MPP system, which is real in reality, fronting tables that are actually back in, or portions of tables that are actually back in the tube, right? So I, I as a user, only need to issue one query. Otherwise, it gets very hard on your users because they have to constantly know what's where, which is not what you want, right? So what you do is you 
you make the MTP system act as if all the data is in it, when in reality it's pulling parts of the answers to that query from the dude. That's where this parallel performing thing comes in, right? So when it needs to read those things, when it needs to read the parts of the data it doesn't have, it can push that to H catalog and say in parallel now feed me back this data. That's obviously still going to be much slower than any of these MPP systems are used to, but it's good enough for these older sets of queries, right? Are you working with any of the MPP right Yes, we are. So um, Hortworks has uh, partnerships with both Microsoft and Teradata. Um, if you've seen Teradata's SQL H project, which they released at the Hadoop Summit, that it's a first step down this, uh, sorry, they actually only released it for Aster at the Hadoop Summit, but Aster is one of their, um, is part of their portfolio. That, that uses the REST interface, the web HCAT stuff I showed you, and it does what I talked about, about using web HDFS for now to get around the fact that we don't have a, an inter, uh, uh, REST interface for the rest of this, but they, this is what, they're one of the driving users for this case, right? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, rule of should keep in mind high dependency, dependency on high version of high. Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. High dependency. So officially H catalogs are up for depends on high version of high. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry, sure. So the question was what how does this relate to high their dependencies, right? What version of since it uses high so heavily, what version of high do you have? Um, it, H catalog 0.4 officially depends on Hive 0.9. I happen to know it works with Hive 0.8, and I know that because for the first week of testing it, I didn't realize I had Hive 8 installed instead of Hive 9. And I ran through all the tests, and 95% of them worked, so there was like one or two things, minor things that didn't work. Um, and then I was trying to figure out why those things didn't work, and I realized I had the wrong version of Hive installed. So um, it does, it, it works with either, pretty much works with either 8 or 9. So, so all that's done in whatever your query language. Is. So the question is, you know, can you do more? You know, my examples were trivial. In order to fit on the slides, slides, the question is, can you do more real things like joins and all that jazz? So that we leave to the query languages, right? That's up to Pig. Pig today supports join. Hive supports join. Whatever. All each catalog does is enable a storage layer for these guys. So whether you're doing joins or splits or um, unions or whatever have you in those languages, that's all in that language and not in each catalog. Each catalog just enables being able to read those records. But it doesn't, um, doesn't put limitations on any of those languages. So anything you can do today in MapReduce or Pig or Pi, you can do with or without each catalog. It doesn't, uh, doesn't you know, limit you to a subset of functionality. Is there, so look, in Hive, it, has the, it enforces the schema on read. Mm -hmm. Is this the same? Are we the same both then? Or is it on the right as well? No, it, it, um, so it does the same thing in terms of handling, if, for example, so one thing I didn't talk about is it, it does handle schema migration. So if you, you know, today your data has three columns and tomorrow you add a fourth column, you don't have to go back and restate your data. It will handle the fact that, you know, as you read across the data sets, it'll add that fourth column with a null for the old ones. It can even handle if you change the format switch from sequence file to RC file, you don't have to go restate the old, it just manages across that. Because um, the meta store stores both schema and um, format information separately for every partition, so it's easy for each catalog to blend those together as you pull them up. Hi. Good. Go ahead. Oh, I did, I uh, so uh, my, my question is, uh, I came to this being not quite understanding from the catalog, and I had a very specific use case in mind, and maybe you can tell me. And I, I feel that probably this technology is not a good fit for uh, our use case. So we have a large number of, of uh, different kinds of memory jobs, and we need to inject the uh, configuration logs, several hundred of key value pairs that would be available to each memory job. And uh, I thought that it's a nice uh, uh, 
it's too large for structured data, but it seems that since the data comes from uh, HDFS itself, in this case, it will be, and uh, there, is, there is additional layer of managing the schema itself, it will not be actually the most performant solution for injecting configuration parameters. So in our, in our case, configuration needs to be injected. It's a Uzi startup, let's say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, that's not really a use case we had in mind in designing it. And I don't know, I don't know off the top of my head how you would tackle that. I mean, that does almost, that's more process metadata, right? And at least today, the page catalog is focused on data metadata. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where you, you know, I look forward to inventing the next great project that solves that problem. Since there's something called cache, shared cache. Okay. A custom solution. Well, custom solution is the first step to open source. <laughs> yes. It looks. It sounds like each catalog will help speed up the development process. Um, if does it have come with the cost of performance hits? So um, the last time we measured the performance hit, it was somewhere under 5%. So it, it, there is, well, okay, so let me back up. If you're using Hive, there's no performance hit because it, it just sees it as part of Hive. We measured it in Pig, and that's where we saw the 5%. I, I don't recall if we measured it against MapReduce or not. Um, basically, though, we were careful when we wrote those interfaces to not copy data. So when you switch from an HCAP record to a pig tuple, which is what has to happen when you bring it in. Hey, if we don't copy the data, we just we have a special tuple implementation that understands that underneath it's really an HCAP record and it just redirects your function calls into the right one, right? So all you're paying is that redirect cost of your function calls, which realistically Java is pretty good at optimizing those away um, as your code gets running. So it, it's uh, the um, cost is pretty minimal. Now, that's, let me give one caveat to that, because right after we released 0.4, we realized we'd screwed up, and we left a bug in there that made the store something like 10 times slower, something horrible. And we missed it. <coughs> we added it, it's one of those last minute fixes that turned out to be a really bad thing, right? And so there is a patch out there that fixes that. If you go to like, for example, uh, if you get page catalog from HTTP, you'll already get the fix. If you download it from Apache, you should find the Jira that has that and apply it and rebuild because then your store functions won't take all day. Um, that was one of those embarrassing oopses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Just sure. Since H catalog does work in conjunction with all these technologies that are rapidly changing all the time, how do you how does your company keep up with technologies, considering that it's you know, very dependent upon each other? So version management is um, is an issue, right? I mean, you've got to work on, you've got to pick a version of Hadoop, Pig, Hive, and HCAT to all work together. Um, realistically, this is the problem that the distribution solved, right? Um, there are open source distributions like Big Talk that solve it by picking some version and putting each of these in. There's um, Hortonworks beta platform does this, Audera does it, but not with HCAT yet. But it's, I mean, HCAT feels a little more acutely, but mm -hmm. all the projects feel like we're all working together, right? So basically the solution that I think people have kind of come down to for this is, is distributions, which realistically in the open source world is what you see, right? You, you don't go download some version of the Linux kernel and then go try to find some version of Oct that works with that Linux kernel. Right, you go to Red Hat or Ubuntu or Slez or whatever your favorite distribution is, and you download it and you get some package and it works all the time. So. I guess the only reasons why I ask is that in the past, some of my clients, for example, go down a certain version and they code yes. it against it, and all of a sudden this change, and it's such a major change today, yes. there's a lot of effort to change it. And I, That's certainly true in any software, right? right. You get, you get established on some version. Um, it has bugs, but the enemies you know are better than the enemies you don't. Right. And so you just stick with it. And I mean, I don't know what the answer is there other than at some point you have to bite that bullet and upgrade, and then you can start to match it from these things, 
Right. I guess what I'm looking for is just a company who's aware of it and work on it versus someday that company does they're not working Okay, so I've, I've tried all through my talk to be very vendor neutral. I'm going to switch, I'm going to throw that switch right now. It's not. And we're running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to attack anybody else. All I'm going to note is Hortonworks is very aware of that, right? We are doing a release every quarter. That's our goal. We do not have any delusion that people will pick up every one of those releases, right? right. We totally know that people will start up some release and it'll be one to two years before they move again, because that's the way companies are, for a very good set of reasons. I mean, you know, my Mac still doesn't have Lion on it because it works, and I'm not going to touch it until you know until some driver somewhere doesn't work, you know, because I don't have Lion or I can't load some app I want. It's going to keep running Snow Leopard or whatever the, I can't remember whatever cap is on there. I, t I totally get that, right? And we so yeah, I guess we we understand. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Other questions? All right, well, thank you very much for having me out here.